Let's begin with the invocation. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now make confession of our sins to God, our gracious and heavenly Father. Eternal God, we confess that by nature we are sinful people. We have transgressed your law in many ways, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not always been wise in our thinking and in our speaking and in our actions. Our motives and thoughts have not always been pure. We deserve your punishment now and for eternity. O oh God, in your mercy, forgive our sin and restore us a full and joyful relationship with you. Through the merits of Jesus our Lord, direct all that we do by your Holy Spirit, that in the year now beginning, we joyfully follow your will and gladly obey your commandments as your redeemed people. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be at peace. Amen. Please rise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The, first, the Old Testament reading today is from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 15. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen a great, chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the rich, riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he sent forth in Christ as a plan for, uh, for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with his promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we require possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord.
Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Today is the 10th day of Christmas. And all of you who are kids at heart, we're still celebrating Christmas, still singing Christmas songs. Even though most of the world has not, and they've ended it, we as Christians still celebrate the 12 days of Christmas, and today is the 10th. If you notice, underneath the Christmas tree over here, in the last few weeks, there was a manger scene. Do you, do you remember seeing that? There was a Mary, and there was a Joseph, and there was a donkey, and there were shepherds, and there was an angel, all underneath the Christmas tree, representing how it's a gift to us from God. This week is different. This week, there's just a itty-bitty manger with hay in it. But what's missing? The baby Jesus. That's because today's lesson is not about Jesus the baby. It's about Jesus the boy. And this morning I have... I don't know if you can see what it says on the top there. I can't reach it because it's all the way up there. Do you see what that says up there? I don't know if you can read that or not. It says growth chart. How many of you had kids and your kids as they grew up, you had a growth chart on the wall somewhere and you would mark 
how tall they were. How many of you did that? Because we did that. It was in a closet door. We'd open the closet door up, and the kids would stand at the bottom, and we'd take a marker out, and we'd mark how tall they were. And the marks would go from here to here to here to here, depending on how, how quickly we'd do it, right? So if we'd have a growth chart out for Jesus, who was 12 years old in our gospel this morning, how tall would he probably be? Do you know what the average girl boy is? I had to look it up. I'm sorry. I had to look it up so I, I understand if you don't know. Unless you have a teen, uh, almost a preteen. Okay? Five, five, it's actually four foot ten. Yeah, four foot ten. So Jesus, at this time in the story when he's at the temple, he's about, roughly, about this tall. He could be shorter. He could be taller. We don't know if Jesus was a, was a short person or a tall person. We don't know how tall he was, right? But on average, that's about the height of a 12-year-old boy. So the next time you see a 12-year-old boy and he's about this tall, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's the average height, right? The average height. And so we can measure people's height. So if you would stand with this growth chart, where would you be at? Would you be at seven feet tall? Six feet? Five feet? It, it measures how, how, how you grow, right? And I don't know about you, but when, we, when I had kids, I hate to use the past tense, but I do, um, you always put down the date of when, where they were at, right? So this would be 12 years old for Jesus. 12 years old. So we measure growth, physical growth that way. It's a reminder to us also as Christians as a growth chart that there's more to just physical growth when it comes to a person, right? There's also mental growth. That's why kids go to school or why they get homeschooled, right? Because we want them to grow mentally. We want them to know things. We want their knowledge to grow, right? And we hope wisdom catches up also and intellect and common sense. We want all that to also take place, right? We want that growth. And that's one of those growths that's hard to measure. Schools do that by testing, right? And then there's the third kind of growth that we oftentimes neglect. And that's spiritual growth. That's the saving faith that God has given to us. The reassurance that we know that our sins have been forgiven in Jesus. You know, when it comes to spiritual growth, Jesus was pretty, pretty high on the spiritual growth chart, even though we really don't have a chart that actually measures it, right? But we as people need to remember that spiritual growth is important, more important than mental growth and physical growth. Jesus lived. And the Gospel of Luke, Luke reminds us of his growth from an infant placed in the manger to a 12-year-old boy. And the next time that Luke mentions Jesus, he's now 30 years old. Reminding us that Jesus was a human being, God in human flesh. He was God but he also lived a life for us. He lived a life perfect for us. He kept the law perfectly for us. And our spiritual life is based upon him. Because many times we, we neglect things. We forget things. But God doesn't. God forgives. And he forgets our sins. And he remembers who we are as his children. And as his children, yes, we grow physically. We grow mentally. And we stay in his word and study his word and we grow spiritually knowing where we belong as his sons and daughters as his children we are forgiven and we have everlasting life and one day we will be with him forever in heaven let's all join together in a word of prayer please pray with me dear god, dear god. Teach, me teach me to grow every day, grow every day. in your word for your word tells us who we are as your forgiven people. In Jesus' name, amen. And we continue with the hymn.
makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness, wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis of our meditation this morning comes to us from the Gospel. We listen again to these select verses. Now, thinking that he was with the company, they went a day's journey, and they found out that he was not with their relatives and with their acquaintances. And when they did not find him, They returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it never fails. It's that one morning That one day that you know you can sleep in, that you don't have to set your alarm clock. As a matter of fact, you make sure your alarm clock is not set so you can sleep in. That one day is bound to happen. You're sound asleep, and that noise, it wakes you up. It startles you. And you think to yourself, what is it now? Yes, that noise, that irritating noise that awakens you on that day that you can sleep in. No, it is not your phone ringing, uh, giving you a phone call. No, it is not your phone giving you a text message. It is not your phone with some app giving you some notification. No, it's not even your phone that you set an alarm for that you forgot to take off. No, it's none of those things. Instead, it's an amber alert. That irritating noise that just makes you want to go, ah, my day to sleep in. I can't believe it. It happened again. You've probably been there before because I've been there for many times. It's frustrating. It's irritating. It's also selfish. Thinking about only ourselves. Thinking about the sleep that I've wasted, that I missed, that I could have slept in because... Some child is missing. How often it is that we think only of ourselves and not of those around us. We think of ourselves and not of that child that is missing, that is lost, that has been abducted, or even possibly has been murdered. We think only of ourselves and not of the parents who have lost that child, that child that is missing, that child that might possibly need help thinking only of ourselves. The amber alert. It's an important alert that we many times, even when we hear it, we can only think of thoughts that are selfish. Think of our text this morning. Jesus, who is 12 years old, and his parents, Mary and Joseph, they are good Jews. And as a good Jew, they always, every spring, go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. The festival of remembering Moses and the children of Israel with the angel of death passing over them. They celebrate this. And they do it every year. And the year when Jesus is 12 years old is not like any other year It's the same. They go as the custom is. And they celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And when the feast is over with, as is the custom, as a group of people travel together, they go back home to Nazareth. But as they go, they've gone a day's journey within this company, and they realize that Jesus is not with them. Can you imagine The heartache, the anxiety, the stress, and yes, the worry. They search for Jesus among their 
relatives, among their friends, and they find Jesus nowhere. So they return to Jerusalem. They go back to Jerusalem. They walk back to Jerusalem. And they search for him. For three long, anxious days, they search for the child Jesus. You wonder what could have been going through Mary and Joseph's mind. What could have happened to Jesus? Where is he at? Because the anxiety for them would have been greater than it is for us even today. Because they, they knew exactly who Jesus was. The salvation of the entire world is missing, is lost, might possibly have been abducted. We can't forget that God did not take away danger when Jesus lived upon the face of this earth. That even when he was a child, when he when was a little infant, God called Mary and Joseph to take him to Egypt out of danger for King Herod was killing all the infants in the Bethlehem area. No, what was going through the mind of Mary and Joseph, we have no idea, but it had to be worry, it had to be anxiety, it had to be awful, as it is with most parents when it comes to losing a child and have a child missing. But if you think about this story, when they find Jesus after three days, they find him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And we ask ourselves the question then in the story, who really was lost? Jesus, the Son of God, was never really lost. He was in his Father's house. He was listening to the teachers. He was asking them questions. He was spiritually growing at that point in time. Actually, who was lost in the story is Mary and Joseph. Because they act just like you and I oftentimes act in times and in moments. They ask Jesus, how could you have done this to us? Yes, Mary and Joseph are just like you and I, concerned about ourselves first and foremost, and then others next. There was a pet store. And in this pet store, there was a bird, a very good parrot. And a man walked into that pet store and saw the parrot, and the parrot was no ordinary parrot. He was one who could quote all of Shakespeare's plays, many poems. He could quote Homer, the Odyssey. He could quote everything in English and in Greek, and some things in Latin and other foreign languages. The bird was amazing, and this man bought the bird for $600. He thought it was a steal, in which it really was. He thought to himself, oh, this is going to be a great thing to show my friends. I'm going to bring them over to my house, and they can hear the bird quote all these things. And just for $600, the man bought the bird, took the bird home, put him in his house, and from that point on, the bird didn't say one single word. Not even Polly won a cracker. The bird was silent. The man could do, in, do anything feed the bird. He would do anything, but the bird just kept quiet. The bird wouldn't shut up in the store, but at home, this man's house, he wouldn't say a word. The man tried to coax him for an entire week, and nothing came out of the bird's beak. So the man took the bird back to the store, wanting his money back. But the pet store owner took the bird and said, what am I to do with this bird? You, you changed the bird. The bird would never shut up here, and he's, he's quiet. Listen to him. He's not saying a word. But i tell you what I'll do. Out of the goodness of my heart, I will give you $100 back for the bird. And the man thought about it for a second and thought, I'll just cut my losses. So he took the $100 and gave the bird back. As the man walked out of the store, he could hear the bird say, don't forget, $250 is my cut. Thinking only of himself. That store owner did that scam again and again and again. Not considering how his customers were. 
So it is with us. Many times we do what we do for ourselves. Yes, many times we are selfish people, considering only ourselves first and foremost, and then others as a mere second or third or fourth. But Jesus, his entire life was not concerned for himself. His entire life, he lived for you and for me. He never was selfish. He was always living for those around him. He was always living for us, keeping the law of God perfectly, listening to the teachers, asking them questions, growing spiritually for you and for me, understanding even more fully and growing in the Lord's favor as many times we fail to do. He did this for us. He went into Jerusalem with his disciples. He was betrayed by one of his own. He was put on trial and found innocent by the Roman authorities, but found guilty by his own people, by a mob who had him crucified. And he died upon that cross for you and for me, not for himself, but for us, taking upon himself as a sacrifice, taking upon himself the sins of the entire world, taking upon himself your sins and my sins, our selfishness, our thinking only of ourselves and not others. And he died for us upon that cross, granting us forgiveness of our sins. And in three days, he rose from the grave, giving us life and salvation eternally. Yes, one day, Jesus was missing from Mary and Joseph as they searched among their relatives and as they journeyed back to Jerusalem. In three days, they searched for him and he was missing. And they found him in the temple. In one day, Jesus was found guilty and hung upon a cross to die. And three days later, from that tomb, he rose again. That tomb is empty, and he lives for us, even to this very day, not thinking of himself, but always living for us. So as we live our lives in this new year, let us always pray that he would be with us and guide us and direct us, that we may live our lives not for ourselves, but for, our, for others. So how many of you made New Year's resolutions? I personally did not. But it's interesting to note the one bad thing about New Year's resolutions, especially as a Christian. Now, New Year's resolutions in themselves are not bad, but in the sense they are bad in that Oftentimes, they are only concerned for oneself, to make one grow, to make one better, and not for those around them. May we this year, whether we have set a resolution or not, live for those around us as Jesus lived for us. For through his sacrifice and his death and through his resurrection, we have been claimed as his sons and his daughters, as his children who once were lost, but now we have everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord our God, for you have had mercy on us and sent your only begotten Son as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we receive your wisdom and blessings with thanks thankfulness. Help us to treasure the life of faith and worship we share and receive the body and blood of our Lord as the guarantee of our salvation and as a foretaste of the feast to come in your eternal kingdom. 
To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and praise together with the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, as we sing together. Sing holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth your glory you fill from depth to height. With our high hosannas, we welcome him who comes in the Lord God's name. Bless the Christ who comes. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, who in giving your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to accomplish our salvation, has manifested your divine love. We thank you for the blessed meal now set before us. Keep us mindful of the sacrifice of our Lord for us. Join together in the name of our Lord and the communion of saints on earth and those in heaven. We pray to you. Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to sanctify and renew us in body and soul for the sake of your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
At this time, open up your container. As we hear the words, our Lord instituted the sacrament for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. We give him thanks, he broke it, gave disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also to the cup after supper, when he given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is new test of my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as all of you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. And now the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you, keep you steadfast in the true faith, life everlasting, and the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us rise for prayer. Blessed are you, Heavenly Father, for you have once again fed and nourished us at your table through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Strengthen and support us, your pilgrim people, so that we grow in wisdom and serve you and our neighbor. Keep us in your care in the year that is beginning, and bring us at last your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord of care and grace, in mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, that the light of your gospel of salvation be proclaimed here and everywhere, that your wisdom be honored and followed, and that your gifts be treasured and shared. Lord of care and grace, in mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, as this new year begins for our nation and for all of the people of the world, that there be an end to hostilities and that times of peacefulness and wellness everywhere prevail. Lord of care and grace, in mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our families and our neighbors. Help us to remember that each person in our lives is a precious gift from you. Guided by your Holy Spirit, help us to choose wisely how we invest our time in the coming weeks and find in our associations with your people a source of mutual support and blessing. Lord of care and grace, in mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all sorts and conditions of people, especially making our petitions for the hospitalized. We pray for those whose lives are in transition, the unemployed, those who are downcast or grieving, and for all those who, whom our intercession is desired. We ask for your presence and healing to be upon those suffering and struggling with cancer. Lord of care and grace, in mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for your guiding, deliverance to be upon those who are in need of your help. For those recovering from surgery, Lord of grace and care, in mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all from we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated.
presence be to each and every one of you. And at this time, you are dismissed to go, and may you continue celebrating the Christ child in your hearts and among your families, and continue to praise him for what he's done for us, for he has given us salvation in his name. God's blessings to all of you, and we'll see you again soon.